Okay, so we are going to start uh, the workshop. So good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the first speaker of today. His name is uh, Yao Shang uh, from Imperial College London, and he's going to talk about applications of kit uh, semi-groups. So thank you very much for accepting. So you can start. Okay, great. Um, so um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the invite um, to this workshop. Um, so I, I think for the most part, the uh, discussion today will be pretty, um, uh, pretty uh, relaxed in the sense that they probably won't give any proofs of any sort. And um, all I really want to do with this talk is to just give some sort of discussion um, in particular to positively preserving semi-groups uh, and discuss some of their applications to other parts of analysis. So uh, a, a brief summary of this is that these are just a collection of results um, that I'm sort of interested in and which I think might motivate some studies of um, heat semi-groups. Uh, so of course, um, with this in mind, a great place to start is probably just going to be the Euclidean heat equation on RN. Um, I don't want to be too formal with um, spaces and whatnot. So uh, I'll just usually hand wave, I think, um, most of the time, um, the spaces to which our functions belong. So obviously this makes sense if um, you use a smooth function of time and space, but uh, we can give it some additional meaning in the weak sense um, and it makes sense for you in L2. Um, so although I'll generally admit some of the details uh, surrounding the spaces to which our functions belong. Uh, you can think of most of the analysis as happening on, um, on L2, if that makes it easier. Um, so for this, we know that there is a um, solution in the sense that if I give this equation a um, initial uh, data F, um, again, for F belongs to some suitable space, then I can solve this equation explicitly um, by convolving the function f uh, against the heat kernel. Uh, and of course, this is our first uh, instance of a, um, a semigroup on L2. So it basically satisfies this uh, uh, composition formula, which um, just mirrors the um, properties of the exponential. Um, so the main point is that we start off with an operator, which is a Laplacian, and then we um, construct a heat semigroup. And it turns out that you can actually invert this procedure as well. So the construction of the semigroup can be inverted in the sense that I can, um, I can obtain the uh, operator Laplacian from the semigroup by uh, performing this limit. Um, so this is just in direct analog with uh, this limit on the real line. And again, this limit should make sense for some, um, for F belonging to some sort of space, which I really won't uh, specify. Um, and the main point is that uh, this can be done with a general abstract semigroup. So uh, we did it for the heat semigroup for the Laplacian, but you can do this with any abstract semigroup. Um, and basically you can generalize the, uh, it's not a generalization, but you can, I can restate the property that we saw earlier, um, this composition property, uh, the fact that it should start the identity if the notation wasn't subjected enough. And um, there should be some sort of continuity, um, the map from T uh, belonging to zero inclusive to infinity should be continuous in some sort of uh, appropriate sense. So. Um, again, you don't really need to know too much about the topology um, with respect to which this map is continuous, but there's some sort of topology out there. Um, and the main point is that you can recover uh, the operator L, um, which generates a semi-group using the same form that we saw earlier. Uh, and most importantly, of course, um, in order for this to make any sense, uh, it turns out that there's a characterization of this semi-group generator correspondence. So we said that a generator can be used to create a semi-group, but we didn't really talk about whether or not the heat equation can actually be solved either in the classical sense or in the weak sense. Um, and we never said anything about whether or not if we took any arbitrary uh, operator, if we'd actually end up with a strongly continuous semi-group. And 
conversely, if we had a strong linkage in the semi-group and we performed this limit, we haven't really said anything about whether or not this limit made sense. Um, for instance, uh, if this limit actually exists um, for a large enough space of F for this operator to be um, nice, I guess. Uh, and it turns out that usually the latter is not a problem. So if you start off a strong linkage in a semi-group and you take this formula to recover the operator, then the operator generally has the properties that you want it to have. Um, but uh, in general, if you take the uh, arbitrary operator L and you create its uh, semi-group, for instance, using spectral theory, then it might not necessarily be strongly continuous. Um, but thankfully, someone out there um, in the past has found a correspondence. Um, so, there's a characterization of the operators L which generate strongly continuous semi groups. Um, and so we don't really need to know too much about the precise correspondence, but we just need to think that it's possible to move from one domain to another. And so I can go from a semi group to a generator and vice versa. Uh, and so, with this in mind, we can ask um, questions about um, when a property of the semi group uh, can be obtained from a property of the operator and vice versa. So for instance, um, it turns out that when you demand uh, that the continuity of the map that we saw earlier be um, with respect to the operator norm, um, then the generator turns out to be bound. Um, and this is basically going to be the um, ultimate talk is I'm going to be interested in when properties of the same group give me properties of the operator. Um, so uh, there's, uh, obviously, other properties that we can look at. Um, this, the continuity of this uh, map isn't too interesting. Another typical property that we'll see later on as well is whether or not a map is contractive. So, uh, if the semi group is contractive, then it basically does not enlarge the norm. And again, there's a characterization of the generators for which a, um, the semi group it generates is actually contractive as well. Uh, so, this is just one example of the type of questions that you can ask. Um, when you're looking at semi groups. Um, so for me, I think, uh, at least with what I'm doing right now, um, I'm currently sort of interested in some of the applications of heat semi groups to spectral theory. So, um, one question uh, along the line of four is how the spectrum of the um, semi group relates to the spectrum of the generator. So, for instance, it's known that you have this sort of inclusion, um, but this inclusion can actually be stripped. And so, well, firstly, this makes the spectrum already interesting to look at because it says that if we know the spectrum of our generator, then we know partially at least um, the spectrum of um, the heat semigroup. Uh, conversely, if we know, for instance, that the right hand side is contained in some sort of ball in the complex plane, uh, then we get some sort of description about um, how large the real part of the spectral value can be of. Uh, a, uh, a spectral value of the generator. Uh, of course, you know, you could ask uh, when is this the strict um, inclusion? Uh, you could ask when it's an equality, uh, much less, that should be a typo, it should probably say equality. Uh, and in general, you can ask uh, whether or not I can describe the spectrum of the generator in terms of the spectrum of the heat semi group. And so there are a few special cases um, that you might expect this can be solved. Uh, or I guess not solved, but some sort of description can be attained. Uh, for instance, um, uh, if the operator is bounded, there's some sort of description. Um, if your operator is uh, normal, um, I believe if your space is a Hilbert space, then there's also another characterization. Um, and it turns out that if you have a specific property of the semi group, um, if it's what's called eventually non continuous, then you also have a uh, description of the spectrum of one generator with um, and its relationship to the spectrum of the heat semi group. Um, so, another problem that you might be uh, interested in is that, um, well, speaking of eventually non continuous semi groups, which are basically semi groups for which um, the map that we saw earlier. So, uh, this map over here um, is eventually continuous. So after some sort of time t, it's eventually continuous. So one specific example of an eventually non-continuous semigroup is a 
contacts any good. Um, and uh, well, it turns out, for instance, that you might be interested in the compactness of your semi group. Uh, and one classic example of when the compactness of the semi group is important is when you're looking at, say, the compact amount of our boundary. Um, uh, and uh, you're looking at the Laplace Beltrami operator. Um, and it turns out that the heat semi group is actually compact. Uh, and therefore, you can conclude that. Um, it's also self enjoying positive, so you can conclude that as discrete spectrum. Um, and it turns out in this particular case as well that the heat semi group can also give you more information about the actual evolution of the eigenvalues. So um, it's well known, I guess, that uh, if you take the trace of your heat semi group, uh, which is the same as integrating along the diagonal of the heat kernel, um, then you can obtain an asymptotic. And then if you use a um, theorem, a Tavarian type theorem, then you can get an asymptotic for Bar's law for the evolution of um, the uh, eigenvalues. So, um, right. So, something that I sort of want to talk about today uh, is basically just positivity preserving semi groups. So, um, the heat kernel for the Laplacian is positive everywhere. Uh, so we'd say it's positivity preserving in the sense that we start off with a non-negative function and we end up with a non-negative function. So this is a bit different to the usual definition of positivity of an operator where, um, where you just want this uh, condition to be satisfied. So for instance, um, if you have a, uh, if you have a uh, non-negative self-adjoint operator, um, a, then it generates a non-negative self adjoint semi group. Well, actually, A doesn't even have to be non negative for this to happen. Uh, but if it is, then it's also contractive. Um, so it's not too interesting um, to uh, use this second definition of positivity. So when we say uh, something is a positive semi group, we generally mean that it's um, a semi group which uh, maps non negative functions to non negative functions. So uh, in a sense, if you start off with non-negative heat, then you uh, stay with non-negative heat. Um, and it turns out that there's actually a characterization of um, such semigroups. Um, so actually, there might be multiple, but one such is the um, berlin Denny criterion. Uh, and I think I'll, in the later slide, I'll actually show uh, this characterization. But I guess the fact that such a characterization exists um, is sort of interesting enough. Uh, so we saw, for instance, that there's a characterization of contractive semigroups. Uh, in the sense, we have conditions on the generator, if and only if conditions um, for which the generator gives a uh, contractive semigroup. And I'm saying the same thing here. There are conditions, if and only if conditions on the generator uh, in order to obtain a positivity preserving uh, semigroup. So um, I guess, uh, that's all nice um, to just have a characterization, but I think for the most part, you might be interested in how to actually use positivity preserving semigroups. So if you have an operator that you want to study, you might be interested in um, forming a teat semigroup. And then if you can prove that it's positivity preserving, we'd like to know what sort of spectral um, results or results in general um, that sort of implies for our operator. So, um, from here on out, uh, I'm pretty much just going to present some results that I think are um, sort of interesting. So, for instance, um, the first result here is by Rosenblum and Salomia, and um, it's in 1997. <clears throat> so, uh, let's start off with a sigma finite measure space, a non negative self control operator, and let's suppose that we have a positivity preserving semi group. Um, and let's suppose as well that L is ultra contracted. So um, uh, this means that there's a, uh, it's, it maps continuously L2 into L infinity. Actually, in the literature, you might also see that it says um, some definitions will be L1 to L infinity. Uh, in the self adjoint case, these are equivalent, um, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, so uh, the idea is that we have a positive preserving um, semi group, and it's also ultra contracted and you actually end up with a result for the negative eigenvalues of this Schrodinger-type operator, L minus V. So um, 
this is a parametric estimate. Um, M L of T is a quantity that is related to the um, constant that appears in the um, ultra contracted bound. So the norm of the uh, L2 to L infinity, um, the, the L2 to L infinity norm. Um, v is some sort of function that's just nice. Um, it has some restrictions in the sense that it needs to behave nicely with respect to L. So um, we can't do, it, it doesn't work with any general V, for instance. There's some sort of dependence on L. Uh, but the function G, for instance, uh, is also, um, well, actually, G does have a slight dependence on L, but for the most part, you can think of it as just a non negative convex function. Um, satisfying some uh, growth estimates at infinity. So uh, the main point is that when we have a positively preserving um, semi-group, uh, we have this type of um, upper bound on the number of negative eigenvalues. Uh, and so this is a parametric estimate in the sense that I can choose my capital G uh, and I can get a different number. Um, and uh, well, one problem might be to try and optimize the choice of G to get the best uh, possible other bound. Um, another problem might be to, uh, well, if you were just interested in upper bound full stop, you might just test it out with a uh, simple function capital G um, for which you know that this satisfies the conditions um, and you can just plug it in and see what you get. Um, so, uh, right, so the fact that L is ultra contractive is already uh, interesting in the sense that it actually implies a bound on the heat kernel um, on the diagonal. Um, so there is a um, upper bound on the heat kernel on the diagonal if you have ultra contractivity and it's related to um, M, L, or T. Uh, and you could ask, for instance, what's the behavior of M, L, and T as um, T goes off to infinity or if T goes to zero, for instance. Um, and, uh, but the main point is that we get this type of estimate over here. Um, so under these assumptions, we get a parametric estimate for the number of negative eigenvalues of this um, Schrodinger type operator L minus V for the simple potential. Uh, and the paper actually goes on to show some more interesting results as well. So um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but it turns out that there are ways to construct um, positivity preserving semigroups um, given another one. So if an operator L generates a positivity preserving semigroup, then there is a class of functions satisfying uh, nice enough properties um, for which uh, F of L also um, generates a positivity preserving semigroup. So there are ways to construct positivity preserving semigroups from another. So one example might be that you can actually take the negative Laplacian um, and you can raise it to a fractional power less than one. And that's also positively preserving. Um, so, but more interesting. Yeah. Uh, what assumptions on V do you need here? For this, what assumptions do we need on V? On the potential, what, uh, you don't write assumptions on the potential in, in the Rosenblum Salomiak theory. Uh, I think the assumptions on the, um, I believe it has, there's some sort of relative boundedness uh, condition that it has to satisfy with respect to L. Um, I don't quite remember the exact details, um, but V, v can't just be any arbitrary um, potential. It does have to satisfy some sort of boundedness condition with respect to L. Yeah, exactly. Okay, maybe yeah. there could be some conditions we should then try to Okay. Right. Um, right, so, uh, right, okay, so, um, uh, it, it turns out that you can actually generalize this a bit more as well. So if, even if your operator doesn't generate a positivity preserving um, semi-group, if it's dominated by a positivity preserving semi-group, which roughly says that the heat kernel is Bounded above by the heat kernel of a positivity preserving semigroup, uh, then you can also get a bound in this form. So, um, this theorem that I've written down here is a special case of that generalization where you can replace L with an operator A, say, uh, 
which is not positively preserving, but um, it's dominated by a positively preserving uh, semi group. So um, I guess um, the main point is that uh, not only can you create um, non negative, uh, sorry, not only can you create positively preserve, preserving semi groups from um, uh, existing positively preserving semi groups, but uh, you can actually apply this result to a uh, operator A, which isn't necessarily positively preserving, but it satisfies some sort of condition with respect to another positively preserving semi group. So, um, one example of how uh, of, of the um, applications of this is that you can apply it to L being the um, negative proportion. Um, and you can apply it to um, some functions of the negative Laplacian, for instance, um, the square root of the negative Laplacian plus m squared minus m um, might be one of interest. And it turns out as well that if you look at the sub Laplacian on a more potent lead group, then uh, that operator generates a uh, ultra contracted Markov semi group. So a Markov semi group is uh, basically a special case of a positivity preserving semi group. And so you can also apply the theorem for that. So um, uh, this is just, I guess, uh, an interesting result that I found um, that basically gives you um, some spectral properties of, uh, of um, these Schrodinger type operators when the operator L uh, satisfies um, a nice enough condition. Um, Another result that I sort of want to talk about is a result by Weiss in 1985, which basically says that if you generate a positivity preserving semi group on equal P for some sort of fits um, P less than infinity, um, you can define a spectral bound um, to be this uh, quantity over here. So it's, it's just the supreme of the real part. And um, you can define the growth bound omega. And it turns out that omega is actually equal to um, the spectral bound. So if the spectral bound is of interest, then one way to obtain it would be to uh, look at the uh, growth bound and vice versa. Um, and it turns out that the spectral bound sometimes is of interest, well, actually the growth bound is sometimes of interest because it relates to properties of the solutions of the equation. So um, if in particular, the spectral bound is negative, then the growth bound is negative. And you can go on to show that this implies that the solutions decay um, in a suitable sense, I think in LP norm uh, to zero. Um, so of course you can also ask questions about um, when the spectral bound is attained. Uh, for instance, um, basically that's a question of, is there a spectral value uh, for which the real part is actually the spectral bound? Um, a bit more recently, uh, this is a result um, by Damon Zip and Kennedy. Um, so if you have a um, strongly continuous semi-group and it satisfies this um, stronger condition, uh, it satisfies this stronger condition, which says that it's eventually positively preserving. So for every function f, after some time, the solution uh, PTF is positively preserving. And in fact, it's strongly uh, positively preserving in the sense that it's bounded below by some sort of positive number, then, um, you can conclude something about the um, semi-group uh, of L minus its spectral bound. Um, and you get a description of uh, the, um, what's called the peripheral spectrum. So the spectrum, um, uh, the spectrum at the spectral bound, basically. Uh, and in particular, you can conclude that the um, spectral bound is attained. Uh, uh, the eigenspace is geometrically sim uh, simple. Um, and uh, I guess that's uh, pretty much the main result. And there is a, also a part of the result which I haven't stated here that relates to resolvents and um, spectral projection onto SLL. Um, but the main point is that we started off with the uh, we started off with one a um, property of the semi group, uh, namely that it's eventually uh, positive, um, and then we concluded something about the spectrum of the generator. Um, so this result turns out to be sort of useful because it turns out that um, if you're looking at differential operators, at least, um, generally you don't have uh, positively preserving semi-groups. Um, the main point being that 
usually you use you prove this using the maximum principle, but you can't get a maximum principle for differential operators um, that aren't second order. Uh, and so as a general rule, you probably can't expect to get a, um, a uh, positivity preserving semi-group um, when you're working in LP space, but if you change your space to um, C and K, uh, C and K being the continuous functions on a, a compact household space, then you can get this type of result. Um, and I think this is the last one, um, but here's another simple uh, result. If you have some sort of Schrodinger type operator and you have some sort of, um, you can look, uh, if you have a potential which is continuous and down below, uh, then you can actually find the um, lower bound of um, the potential by looking at the um, L2 norm of the uh, semi-group. So um, in particular, if it doesn't satisfy this exponential bound, then you know, your potential is not bound below. So again, this is just one example of how properties of the generator can give properties of the semi-group and uh, vice versa. Um, now, I just sort of want to also very quickly just give some examples of positively preserving semi groups. So, for instance, uh, the classic result is that um, if your resolvent is eventually positively preserved, so for sufficiently large lambda, um, the resolvent is positively preserving, then um, you get a positively preserving semi group. Um, I, this turns out to be an if and only if, although I haven't written it here, but. Um, I guess this might not be too surprising to some of you if, um, uh, if, if you happen to know that, for instance, that there's a relationship between the uh, heat semi group and the resolvent. Um, I think there are some integral representations uh, for one in terms of the other. Um, the characterization of a positively preserving semi group that I um, mentioned earlier is by Billy and Denny, and um, it basically says that. If you have a non-negative self-adjoint operator L2, then all you need to do is double check this um, condition and see if it uh, holds true or doesn't hold true. Uh, and so for instance, it's very easy to show that you don't have a positively preserving semi group um, if you can find some sort of function F which uh, violates this bound. So uh, th this might make it sort of, I guess this might make all this sort of useful because it means that you can quickly check, I get to it. If I have a positively preserving semi group, um, and if you do, then you're in good shape, but if you don't, then, uh, if, you don't really have to worry about any of the results we just talked about. Um, and another uh, simple example is that if you have a self adjoint diffusion, then you also get a um, positivity preserving syndrome. Um, so that's, um, that, that sort of a, uh, covers most of what I want to talk about on the, um, spectral properties of the positivity preserving semi groups. I do want to give one last example um, of a positivity preserving semi group, and these are the um, Markov semi groups. So um, these are semi groups which basically satisfy the additional property that then maps one to one and it's positivity preserving. Uh, so, for instance, um, the first condition actually turns out to be quite generic in the sense that if your operator maps one to zero, then um, that condition is satisfied. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned that uh, something about Markov semi groups. Um, uh, I think I mentioned something about the subreplation of the more potent Li group um, generating a Markov semi group. So that's just one of the examples, but um, uh, I'll give another example later on. So in this case, usually the measure on the space plays a big role. Um, and you generally want mu to be an invariant probability measure, which roughly means that it satisfies this um, integral identity over here. Uh, so this does imply that um, the semi group is strongly contracted in L1, uh, L, L infinity, and then by interpolation, uh, every LP space uh, in between. Um, and so the usual example that uh, when in this context is uh, this Laplacian minus some sort of gradient drift. Um, and it has a very nice uh, invariant probability measure of dmu equals to e to the u. So I'll generally assume that it's a probability measure, although it doesn't have to be. Uh, it's true, for instance, that the invariant measure for the Laplacian is Lebesgue measure, but of course Lebesgue measure is a probability measure. Um, 
And then it comes from the fact that if you have a Markov process, then the law of the Markov process um, the, the obtain a Markov semi group by taking this uh, conditional expectation um, over here. Uh, and lastly, we normally also request that it is reversible in the sense that um, this semi group is symmetric in L2 mu. Uh, so this is um, a sufficient condition, is basically that um, your operator self adjoint in L2 mu. Uh, so the generic case is that your operator will be self adjoint um, So this condition generally you don't have to worry about too much. Um, and uh, basically it turns out that there is a um, correspondence between an invariant measure mu um, together with a what's called a Kedja charm, which is essentially an operator uh, which I'm defining right now. So um, if I start off with a generator, then I can define the Kedja-Trump gamma um, directly by a formula. And if I start off with a generator, I can find an invariant measure mu. I haven't really talked anything about uniqueness but, um, or, or resistance for that matter, but um, L does characterize mu in the sense that uh, the integral of LF with respect to mu should be zero for every function f um, in a suitable domain. Uh, and conversely, um, this the generator is characterized by this data through um, this equality over here. So if you give me gamma, and if you give me uh, mu, then I can give you um, the generator L and vice versa. If, I give you gen if you give me the generator L, I can give you the invariant measure mu and I can give you the uh, operator gamma. So uh, this sort of just mirrors our previous correspondence where we had a correspondence between the semi-group and the generator through some sort of characterization theorem. Um, and again, the point here is that there is some sort of correspondence between, um, uh, there's some sort of correspondence between a generator uh, and this pair, this, uh, this data of measure mu uh, and this operator gamma. Uh, and so, of course, that means that you can ask the same questions. You can ask when does the property of the generator um, lead to a property of the measure mu and, and um, the separated gamma and vice versa? Uh, when does the property of the pair give the property of the generator? Uh, so in the spirit of um, uh, spectral results, uh, I guess I'll just talk about two main ones, which are probably quite well known in the literature. Uh, so if you want what's called a spectral gap for your operator, which basically says that uh, the spectrum is contained in uh, zero and there's some sort of gap between zero and some sort of positive number C, uh, one way would be to use the correspondence between the semi-group and the generator and go through the semi-group. So it turns out that um, if you look at the variance with respect to your probability measure mu, and you can show that the variance um, decays exponentially fast with respect to time, then this implies a uh, spectral gap for your generator L. Um, so alpha of C here is just some sort of function of C. I, I, I don't think it's too important um, uh, to know what it is, but it's just some sort of constant. Um, and the other way would be to go through a functional inequality involving mu and gamma, which is called a point carrier inequality. So um, I, I've put in brackets equals the integral of the gradients because I guess um, a, a, a typical example is that at least when we're looking at operators, um, so when we're looking at operators of the form at the top, that's delta minus nabla mu dot nabla. Uh, for these type of operators, uh, the quantity on the right hand side is precisely the um, squared gradient. So, um, what I'm claiming is that I can get some sort of spectral um, result uh, for my generator if I either look at it through the semi group and I prove this variance property, or if I look at it through the um, measure mu and the operating gamma and I prove this functional inequality at the bottom. Uh, there's a generalization of this called a um, Super point array inequality, which describes the essential spectrum. So, um, uh, the essential spectrum um, is contained in some sort of um, half line from one over epsilon to infinity, if and only if you have this um, 
inequality at the bottom. So you have the uh, F integral of F on the left-hand side, you have the gradient on the right-hand side, and then you have some sort of, um, uh, you have some sort of uh, expectation squared on the right-hand side as well. So if you can take epsilon to be zero, then the essential spectrum is uh, empty and you end up with only this good spectrum. Um, so this is just, I guess, um, one way to show that your operator has this good spectrum would be to try and establish uh, this type of inequality for R greater than zero. Um, uh, so I think, um, right, so in that same paper, it was shown that um, if you have some additional um, properties on beta, then you can actually get some additional properties on the semi group as well. So, um, for instance, uh, if I, I forget what the properties of beta are, um, but you can get ultra contractivity of the semi group. And we saw, for instance, that ultra contractivity was a condition. Um, was a condition in the result by Rosenblum and Salomiak. Um, and I believe you also know that if the super point array inequality holds under some additional conditions, then um, you get a uniform integrability condition uh, on the same group as well. Uh, so for every function f, there's some sort of um, upper bound on the L2, uh, L2 norm. Uh, which decays as R goes off to infinity and it decays uniformly in there. Um, in the specific, specific case where the essential spectrum is empty and the spectrum is purely discrete, uh, you can also get lower bounds on, for instance, the nth eigenvalue of your generator. Um, so, uh, right, so, so the main point is that uh, we saw that we could get spectral properties of our generator um, by looking at the semi group. Um, and we're saying over here as well that we can get um, spectral properties of the generator by looking at functional inequalities. Um, but because of the equivalence between all these three concepts, um, looking at the functional inequalities is basically the same as looking at the semi group and vice versa. Um, so these are just ways to get information about the generator um, uh, through, through the semi group or through functional inequalities. Um, and I uh, don't think I will discuss too much about it, but uh, there are other functional inequalities um, that aren't really discussed yet. So the main ones, um, it turns out, are the point array and the super point array inequality um, as far as spectral results are concerned. Um, but you can look at other types of inequalities as well. So for instance, there's a um, well-known logarithmic Sobolev inequality. Uh, that you can study. And it turns out that this is related to, um, uh, this is related to the semi-group through an entropy decay. Uh, and it's also related to the semi-group through this um, contractivity type estimate uh, called hypercontractivity. So instead of mapping um, LP into LP, it's mapping LP into LQ for some Q dependent on T. Um, and it's doing so with the concept of one. Um, so I believe there are um, ways to actually get spectral results um, uh, for the log, log turbulent inequality as well. Um, so I believe it's possible, for instance, at least in a specific case, um, to obtain a log turbulent inequality um, from the spectrum itself. Um, I don't have a reference for this on me, uh, unfortunately, um, but I believe that is the case. Uh, and in some specific cases, for instance, uh, if we're looking at um, delta minus nabla u dot nabla, for instance, uh, a logarithmic sub of inequality implies some uh, growth conditions on u. Um, and these growth conditions will then in turn imply, for instance, that the generator has purely point spectrum. Um, so there are some spectral implications for the logarithmic sub of inequalities, but um, I feel they, they're not as direct as with the point array uh, and the super point array inequality. So um, this is a bit more of an afterthought. Um, and uh, there is also, um, right, so I just mentioned that, there is also a Sobolev inequality. Um, 
Uh, these also have some special implications. They're related to, for instance, ultra-contracted bounds, and ultra-contracted bounds are related to bounds in the heat kernel, uh, and bounds in the heat kernel um, are related to the spectrum in the sense that they can, for instance, be used to prove that the um, spectrum is discrete. Um, so uh, I believe there is also another result um, prior to Rosenblum and Solomiak, um, which actually uses uh, server load inequalities. So um, the, their result was a bit more general than the previous result um, in the sense that you didn't need a Markov semi group, you just need a positivity preserving one. But um, prior to the result, it was known that if you did have a uh, non negative self adjoint operator generating a Markov semi group, um, and satisfying this type of load, um, this type of server load inequality, then again, you get some sort of bound on the number of negative eigenvalues uh, of the Schrodinger type operator, um, uh, L minus V. And so in this case, this is different to the uh, bound that we saw earlier in the sense that there's no capital G. So there's no, uh, it's not a parametric estimate where you have to choose a capital G. Um, you simply have this estimate where C is a function of uh, Q. Um, the Q is any number greater than two. K is some sort of constant. Uh, and V is our potential, and V just has to belong to LP and be non negative. Um, uh, in this case, P is 1 minus 2 over Q uh, to negative 1. Um, so uh, I guess I sort of want to just emphasize that but these other inequalities do have um, spectral properties, um, and they are interesting to study. Um, but I guess, um, at least to me, it seems that pointer and super pointer and for these, um, uh, at least as far as uh, spectral results are concerned, these are the main ones. Um, but that doesn't mean that these other functional inequalities are contributing to study. And that doesn't mean that these other functional inequalities can't imply something about um, the spectrum either. Um, so there are some other properties that aren't discussed here. Um, so for instance, uh, the contractivity type estimates that we saw earlier, just up here, um, are uh, related to functional inequalities. Um, there's relationships to um, things like exponential tenability. So basically a question of if I have a tenable function, when is its exponential also integrable? Um, but I, uh, I didn't really feel, um, to, to, to make the focus on spectral theory, I sort of just, uh, I won't talk about these. Um, and there are also relationships between the functional inequalities themselves that might be interesting to study as well. So when does one imply the other? Uh, when are they equivalent? Uh, it turns out, for instance, that the logarithmic total of inequality is, um, implies the point array inequality and that you can go from the point array inequality back to a log total of inequality um, if you have another functional inequality uh, that's really satisfied. Um, and there are ways to interpolate between these inequalities as well. Um, uh, and there's also some, there are some equivalences between the inequalities. So uh, the usual one that's referenced is that the sober and the Nash inequalities are equivalent in certain cases. Um, from the perspective of obtaining uh, results about the generator, of course, these um, don't really play a role, but I guess I just want to mention that um, this is an area of study you can, um, that uh, you might want to be interested in trying to uh, find relationships between the semi group and the functional inequalities uh, without um, with, uh, thinking about the generator in between. Um, so I, I think this um, more or less uh, wraps up what I want to talk about today. So. Um, uh, the concepts of this, which I said I would um, talk about now, is that um, there is a problem that I'm looking at, which uh, basically involves trying to deduce some properties of an operator. And I'm interested at looking at the semi-group of the operator and trying to see if I can prove any properties of it, um, positivity preserving being one idea. So um, the idea is that if I can prove that it's positivity preserving, then I can apply some of the results that I've um, talked about today. Um, I get that nice uh, the upper bound on the number of negative eigenvalues, 
Uh, and so that's uh, what I really want to dedicate to those taught to. Um, in the context of, um, for instance, microbial analysis and pseudo differential operators, um, uh, I'm aware that, uh, for instance, the fractional equation is um, does generate positivity preserving semi group. Um, and as far as I know, uh, for certain eigenvalues, the Bidwish to one in that um, is a pseudo differential operator and it also generates a positivity preserving semi group as well. So there are applications, I guess, to um, um, sort of differential operators, um, but you, it's sort of, you know, you, you have to check if it's actually positivity preserving before you can actually use any useful results. Um, so uh, I think that's all I really want to say. So um, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, then I'll be glad to take them. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shang, for your really nice talk. So as Shang told, if you have any question, please uh, un unmute yourself and ask. I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Yes, you know, uh, it took my attention, uh, the, the result of uh, the LPLQ, uh, no, LQL2. Uh, estimate that you present uh, that in which you mentioned that is a, a, a result previous to the to the theorem of Rosenblum and Solomia. Right. Sorry. Let me just step back there. Um... I, I think that it was at the end of your talk. Uh, pre somehow three or four slides. Uh, is this the slide you're your... talking about or? Yes, I think that is the, uh, this is L2, L infinity estimate, but I think that is uh, the estimate uh, from, LQ to, from LQ to L2 that you present at the end. I think it's the end, by, by the, the end, end of your presentation. Oh, right. Um, uh, and this then one. this one, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly this one. Uh, do you know something about this uh, constant, C of Q? C of Q in a specific cases, if this constant is a chart or if you have explicit expression for that constant? Uh, I believe there is an explicit expression, but um, I don't recall if it's sharp. Uh, oh. Yes, uh, I think, um, yeah, this, this result is, um, the result of Rosenblum and Solomon sort of generalizes this result as well. Um, in the sense that I removed a lot of the assumptions. So although this result is um, non-parametric in the sense that the capital G doesn't appear. Um, okay. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, not entirely I'm not entirely sure if uh, anything can be said about this concept. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay, many, maybe other questions? Uh, I have a question. So I know that, uh, well, as you mentioned, in the case of a manifold, you can use the heat kernel and actually to get the index of the operator, right? So that's right. like the Atija Singer index. Uh, for general semigroups, you can also develop like an index theory for them in such generality. I mean, you have uh, results uh, of the eigenvalues, but you can also study the index. Yeah. Oh, so, the, so the question is, can we also study the index of these um, operators? Yeah, using the semi-group associated uh, or the properties or say something about the index so in general. Uh, I don't think, um, I'm not sure. And I don't think I'm qualified to uh, say anything about this, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So maybe other questions?